Hey, my name is Dr. Brendan McCarthy. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Protea Medical Center in Chandler, Arizona. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. You know, today was a unique episode. I was thinking about doing this after the last one. I had a patient ask me, she actually messaged me and she said, you know, why, why didn't she ask me personally? Why didn't you go more into Whole30? She said, you know how much that changed my life. And she is such an advocate for that diet because it did. The thing about diet, and we will do more episodes on this in the future, what we eat affects us on so many levels. And, and I know that. You all know that. We all know what we eat affects us. True. It's just what we eat also affects us on a genetic level. And I know that could sound like hyperbole, like I'm just making it seem extreme how diet can change your genes. Hear me out. What you eat triggers gene expression. The world around us triggers gene expression. Okay, it's called epigenetics. And, and when you eat certain foods, you're going to upregulate some genes. And you eat other foods, you downregulate those genes. This is how the world works. This is how your body is made. This is how your body responds to the environment around you. I've had patients present to clinic with autoimmune conditions specifically. And I see you out there. I remember that one time, and, and this is for you. She was diagnosed with Sjogren's, which is an autoimmune condition. Uh, where your body attacks itself. And in this case, it was a, attacking your salivary glands and she would have dry mouth. Um, and over time, a lot of times that spreads as well. And we sat down together going over her labs and I ran a genetic profile on her and we went over options. Now her, her, her rheumatologist gave her, her di very different options than what I did. I gave her a diet plan. I gave her Whole30. And I sent her on her way. I had her come back to my clinic a month later. And the Sjogren antibodies all went down to being un unmeasurable. I remember that. That was such a pivotal point in my life as a doctor. And it changed her life. And all she did was that Whole30 diet. I know that sounds like I'm giving out hyperbole. Like, oh my gosh, this, I'm hyping this up. I have no shares in Whole30. I've, there's nothing that I get from that other than the satisfaction as a physician. I saw someone's life change based upon diet and she is way more empowered than she would have been any other way. And it changed her life. And that's why she wrote me that message. She's like, why didn't you talk about how amazing this diet is? Uh, I, so I promised her I would make a little snippet on that. And so I have seen Whole30 work. Why did it work? Why did it do that? It works on a lot of different levels and I'm not gonna to get too deep into the science because I realize there's so many videos out there about Whole30 and what it does and how it works. I'm not gonna to get too in depth. I'm just gonna be very specific to this one case. This patient had a genetic predisposition towards autoimmunity. That genetic predisposition to autoimmunity was flared by her diet. When she would eat fast food, you know, basically it was gluten for her, this is the end of days gluten. And I'm careful right now because I don't want you to think just a gluten-free diet is going to cure everything. It does not. There have been times where I thought, oh, just take gluten out of the diet, it'll be better. It wasn't. It was something else. It was, a, it was egg whites. There was a case where I had a patient was egg whites was the problem with him. So let's just go back to this whole gluten thing. Gluten was the upregulator for her. But it's more than just that. That diet, that was a very refined diet, compromised her intestinal tract health. She wasn't eating enough food rich in micronutrients. She was eating a lot of processed foods. Blood sugar was bouncing around all over the place. Just was, it's not, it doesn't just mean you're eating gluten and your gene gets turned on. There's a whole thing that happens with eating a refined diet. Your intestinal tract becomes more compromised. You're not eating enough fiber. You're not eating foods that are going to feed the microbiome in your intestinal tract. You're not helping yourself. So when you do a diet like Whole30, it's not just eliminating allergens out of your diet. It's pushing you in towards eating a more vegetable-driven diet with healthy protein choices, which is truly the best diet you could ever recommend to a patient. Why, why does that diet work? What is it that makes that diet work? You're avoiding the most common allergenic foods, wheat, dairy, corn, soy. You are avoiding all kinds of sweeteners. You're avoiding refined foods, processed foods. 
you're also avoiding beans, legumes. And now I'm an advocate for beans. I truly am. I believe that it's important to eat beans. But with that said, there are compounds in beans called lectins that we're not all good with. Some are good with, some are not. So when we do an elimination diet, we have them remove legumes or beans from their diets during that time so we can figure that out. So we're eliminating all these things out of their diet and putting into it a more whole healthy diet and during the time the patient's on that, it gives their intestinal tract a chance to heal. You stop signaling to the system that autoimmune signal. You stop that epigenetic signal. The antibodies can start to come down. And that's the beauty of doing a diet like Whole30 with my autoimmune patients. And in those cases with Sjogren's, I saw the before and after lab work. And the patient felt better. Now, in the years since, whenever she has gluten it turns it back on and, and antibodies come back up. And I've caught it a few times. She tried it out and we've caught it. So again, why again, wasn't gluten-free good enough? Because if I just took gluten out of her diet, she would not have been, okay, let me eat a less refined diet. You could do a very unhealthy gluten-free diet. You could do a, a gluten-free diet that has gluten-free pizza, you can have gluten-free, there's candy, you can have there all kinds of junk you can put in your body that's gluten-free. And so by doing that, would that have healed her intestinal tract or improved her overall wellness? No. It will slow down or stop the epigenetic signaling of Sjogren's, yes. But I would not create a healthy patient. Remember, when I said this, and I said this in a previous episode, and this is important to circle back to, and I think this is a theme I need to keep on talking about. When the patient presents to the clinic, their idea of what we should do is sometimes very different from my idea of what we should do. A lot of times the patient wants me to get rid of their symptoms, but they don't want to change their lifestyle. They want me to get rid of this condition they have and make sure their lab work goes back to normal without having to change their diet and lifestyle. And I know as their physician that the most important thing I could do is change that diet and lifestyle because by doing that, I eliminate the cause of the condition. When the patient comes to clinic and says, fix my symptoms, I'm not willing to change my lifestyle, what do I do then? I have to stabilize them. I have to give them medication that's going to stabilize them. And then I'm going to have to really work at letting them know how to change their lifestyle in a healthy way. I need to convince them of changing their lifestyle. It's a big part of the job as a physician. That's what that word doctor means. Docere, it means to teach. And the role of the physician is to teach the patient, educate the patient. A lifestyle change like Whole30 would be beneficial. When I need to prescribe a diet to a patient like Whole30, a lot of times they're in a diet plan and you're out there and you know what I'm saying right now. You're used to your diet. You don't want to change your daily routine. You don't want to get rid of that food or that that, that, that um, cuisine that you've grown up with. It's a part of who you are. But a lot of times it's part of what got you where you are at this moment. So I need to figure out how to transition you from what you're doing to what you need to be doing. That's not easy because the foods we talk about here, the foods that tend to cause a problem are addictive. Gluten is an addictive food. Sugar is an addictive food. Dairy is an addictive food. There's a reason why these things are comforts. There's a reason why they're comforting. They all release something called exorphins. And exorphins are exogenous opiate-like compounds that affect your dopamine. There's a reason why they're a comfort food, because when you consume them, you release more dopamine. And that dopamine release kind of gives you that good feeling. That's why a, a slice of pizza is way more desirable than a salad. You want that pizza or cookie or cake, or whatever it is, that's a combination of dairy and, and wheat and sugar. You know, those are the things that people all go for. Giving up your comfort foods, going on an elimination diet, you will feel uncomfortable for the first few days, no doubt. And it's uh, uh, disconcerting. Your blood sugar will be a little weird. You'll feel like something's missing. You'll feel uncomfortable, maybe a little agitated, a little anxious, but it passes. The physical component of addiction when it comes to food is minor. And withdrawal symptoms from these foods is minor. It's a tiny little scratch. It's like a little little thing in there. But it goes away. What makes it difficult 
is the mental addiction. The part where you're like, I need this. I like this. I love this. This is a part of me. This is what I want. The mental part is the part I need to sit down with the patient and unravel that with them. I need to show them that there was never a benefit of eating that food. This never really made them happier. And if the happiness they got from it is very temporary, but long-term, it gave them not much happiness. And I show how there's a short little benefit, but long-term, there's there's negative outcomes. We use our lab work for that, and we show them, this is, this is not helping you long-term. So if I can show them the mental component, if I could break down that mental addiction part first and explain to them the physical component, that physical part of your addiction, that's going to go away quickly. That's just maybe three days of being uncomfortable. You can hang in there with that. That's not that bad. It's the mental part that makes it almost un undoable. The mental addiction part makes it difficult. Anybody who really wants to stop something, really, really wants to, they tend to have a better result. But if you're kind of quitting, but you still love the food, picture like that. I tell you, you can't eat pizza. You can't eat wheat, dairy, uh, or, or sugar. I tell you, you can't do it anymore and you won't do it anymore, you can't have it. And I, and I lock it away, you can't have it. You still crave it up here in your mind. You still want it because you still believe in it. You still love it. So you will mentally be addicted to it even after the physical addiction goes away. And that'll get to the point where you have the opportunity to eat it again. You go back and you eat it again because you have the mental addiction to it, no longer the physical. We need to treat the mental addiction to these foods. We need to unravel why it is that you eat them. You know, unravel the perceived benefit that you have from it. Once we do that, it's easier to do a diet like Whole30. I have a patient that presents to clinic and upon assessing their diet, it looks like it's not the best diet they're consuming. It's not a lot, a lot of fruits and vegetables. There's not a lot of really um, good options in there when it comes to healthy fiber sources or they're not eating on the regular. They're not eating three meals a day or even two meals a day. They're just eating all day long, snacking and, and grazing on chips. And, and that happens. You know, I like to use a template like Whole30 because that is an easily accessed diet for people. It's a very simple dietary protocol to go through that has great cookbooks for it. And, and it works. Even if my patient will only eat one meal a day, a Whole30 one meal a day, I'm fine with that in the beginning. Because I know that by them doing that, they'll see an improvement in their overall health. So in closing, a protocol like Whole30, we use it for patients who have autoimmune conditions. We use it with patients who have a lot of inflammation. But I also like to use it as a reset diet with people. They can use the variations of it. Like I mentioned, one meal a day that they do that's going to be a Whole30, that's going to move their health in a positive direction. And I can use that foundation to kind of say, okay, well, let's give me a whole week of just being Whole30. And you slowly expand it like that and make that be their overall baseline diet. I hope this helps. Please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you. <laughs>